I've mentioned this before, and I said it just a minute ago, but your expressions of sympathy uh, and my dad's home going, deeply appreciated. And all the cards and text messages that, that have been coming, Ellen and I read through a pile of those. Again, just last night, we, we had, we're opening them up and we take turns going back and forth. But I was struck by a, a phrase in one of the cards that stood out to me. And I want to read to you what was written there. Thinking of you at a time when distance from family has a whole new meaning. That resonated. I was blessed to be raised in a loving family. And I know that's not everyone's story. Not everybody shares that, that blessing. So I'm grateful for my upbringing. Do I wish I lived closer to my younger brother? He's the one that's been tasked with assisting my elderly parents, uh, bidding them farewell on behalf of his siblings. I definitely wish I was closer and more involved in that entire process. So I grieve from a distance, from a distance, though my heart longs to be closer to my family. And in a way, as I've thought about this and ruminated on it, it's reminded me of John's words, and I have them here for you. Beloved, we are God's children, what does it say? Now. now. If I'm in Christ today, through faith in his name, I've received forgiveness for sin, I currently belong to his forever family. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. We're here in God's where? There, wherever there is, but we're here. But we know eventually that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. In essence, there's coming a day when the earthly gap between this life and eternity will be removed. There will be no more distance. And yet at Christmas, we often sing Emmanuel, Emmanuel. His name is called, sing it with me, Emmanuel. God with us, revealed in us, his name is called. Sorry, so long, Emmanuel. I can do that because I let it. I can pick the, the key. <laughs> we sing the words, don't we? But how often do we lose sight of their wonder? especially in seasons of duress, especially when global pandemics descend, especially when death comes calling. Well, thankfully, biblical truth never wanes, as this next clip is going to show. So things haven't turned out as you hoped. life took a turn. A bump. A darkened sky. And at times it may have seemed there was no hope. But here's the good news. Our God is the God of fresh starts. Our God is the God of new beginnings. Our God brings new mercies, new compassions, not just once a year, not just when things are bad, but every single morning. This season has been tough. And for many of us, things will never be the same. But we are here, breathing, maybe smiling, or crying, or shouting, or laughing. But we are here, feeling. Maybe fighting, or cheering, 
or seeking or grieving, but we are here, living. And we are not alone. Our God is here. Our God is with us. And our God is the God of new creations. We are here. We are not alone. Our God is here. Our God is with us. And he makes how many things new? All things. You can call it a touch of heaven. You can, you can call it a taste of what's to come. But the omnipresent creator of the universe is nearer than you think. As the Apostle Paul says in the book of Acts, he is not far from each one of us. Not far from each and every one of us. And so in moments of despair, we take solace in the abiding presence of one who is greater than our pain. One who promises never to leave us nor forsake us. David declares this in Psalm 23. If you take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 23, I would love to show it to you. David was a prolific songwriter, and like many professional artists, he was very personal. He was transparent in what he wrote. Most of his lyrics emerged from life experience, whether good or bad. But all the songs, of all the ones he composed, none is more popular than the 23rd. It stands out, heads and tails, above the rest. In this particular song, he draws from his own past experience as a shepherd. And he beautifully portrays the relationship he enjoyed with his divine shepherd. The same relationship extended to every Christ follower. But within this intimate song, he also illustrates what has been our current sermon series. Seven compound names of God, all beginning with the Hebrew term Yahweh or Jehovah. And my prayer during this time has been for a deeper appreciation or a fuller understanding of who God is. So our passion for him might increase. He won't be like a spare tire in the trunk that we take out only in emergencies, but someone that's a, a part of the ebb and flow of our day-to-day -day lives. So with this in mind, let's begin today's exploration. Psalm 23, David, the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Ra'ah. I am able to rely on him because he is what? Reliable. I shall not want or lack. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. He's resourceful. When my supplies begin to wane, his resupply is always there. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. In him I find true rest. In him, I find authentic refreshment. He restores my soul. He's the Lord that heals. Jehovah Rapha. He's in the restoration business. Some people restore cars. God restores the soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake or glory. He is Jehovah Sikkenu, the Lord our righteousness. He'll always do the right thing at the right time because he is righteous. And then we come to a pivotal verse with universal application. And here it is in our slide. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What a statement. Where do you even begin to unpack such a powerful verse? I feel there's one phrase central to the rest, the, the hinge on which everything hangs. You are with me. Take a 
take that out, and the rest of the verse crumbles. Without the shepherd's presence, all else becomes moved. But with Jehovah Shammah, the Lord ever-present is with you in the valley, it changes everything. At its core, David's lyric is relational, based on God's presence. But where does this compound name actually appear? I'm so glad you asked. Take your Bibles and turn over to Ezekiel chapter 48. He's a neighbor to Daniel, lives very close to Daniel. They both reside in an area beyond the Psalms. I'm helping you out, throwing you some bones. Ezekiel chapter 48. As you turn there, let me set the scene. Ezekiel is God's priest and prophet. He's ministering during Judah's 70 year captivity in Babylon. His name literally means God strengthens or strengthened by God. Wouldn't you like to have that kind of name today? God is strengthening me today. I need that today. And this is a unique name, especially in light of Judah's refusal to listen to Ezekiel. But God reassures him in chapter 3. Here's what God says to his messenger. Behold, I have made your face strong against their faces, and your forehead strong against their foreheads. Like adamant stone or a diamond, harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. Do you know anyone who is hard-headed? Do you live with someone who is hard-headed? It turns out that Ezekiel, according to what I just read, was a spiritual hardhead, but with God's sanction. So if you're going to be hardhead, this is the only kind that you can be. Normally we think of that term in a negative connotation, don't we? They're just unreasonable. You can't get along with them. But Ezekiel is hardhead because God made his forehead that way against Judah and their rebelliousness against his word. Ezekiel's assignment was broad in scope. He was addressing a generation born during the Babylonian exile. And so he, first of all, identified the cause of their current detention. He spoke about coming judgment on the Gentile nations around them and Israel's future national restoration. His message was a mix, and I quote, of both horror and hope condemnation and consolation. Early on in Ezekiel, the glory of God departs from the temple, and towards the end, that same glory returns during the kingdom age, or the millennial age, which is future. At that time, when this occurs, the 12 tribes of believing Israel will be united and flourishing in New Jerusalem. So I have a question for you. If you had to choose one name to encapsulate the wonder of that city at that time, especially for Israel, I mean, this has been foretold, prophesied, you're awaiting this great and glorious day. If you had to choose a name, what would you pick? Of all the descriptive titles at our perusal, how might we adequately describe such a wonderful place? Well, look at verse 30 of Ezekiel chapter 48. These are the exits of the city where it will be at that time. On the north side, measuring 4,500 cubits, or 1.5 miles, the gates of the city shall be named after the tribes of Israel. The three great gates northward, one gate for Reuben, he was the firstborn, one gate for Judah, that was the royal tribe, and one gate for Levi, the priestly tribe. On the east side, 4,500 cubits, or again, 1.5 miles, three great gates. I don't know why I want to call them graves. They're not graves, they're gates. And one gate for Joseph, 
one gate for Benjamin and one gate for Dan. On the south side, measuring again 1.5 miles, one gate for Simeon, one gate for Issachar, one gate for Zebulun. On the west side, 4,500 cubits, again, no surprise, with their three gates, one gate for Gad, one gate for Asher, and one gate for Naphtali. All the way around shall be 18,000 cubits, and the name of the city, that city from that day shall be, the Lord is there. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord ever present. Isn't this the glorious reality that makes us look forward to heaven ourselves? Isn't this the reason we anticipate being there? Because we'll finally see him as he is. We long to be reunited with loved ones who have gone before. Heaven has a whole new anticipation for me now, doesn't it? <clears throat> Mom and dad are there. We look forward to meeting our favorite Bible characters in heaven. We want to gaze on the good angels. I mean, those are some powerful beings. It's going to be fun to see them in their, their initial, what, what God created them to be. We can't wait to walk on translucent streets of gold or to linger at the river and lap up the water of life. But all of these things, and I mean all of it, pales in comparison to the splendor of God's presence. John explains it. And I, John, heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Why? Because he's Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there. Marvelous truth, amazing reality, tremendous promise, comforting presence. The relational focus here is overwhelming. What makes heaven so special? Jesus said it best. In my, whose house is it? Father's house are many rooms. Have they all filled up yet? Nope. New. <laughs> if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Listen, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, and oh, you're going to love it, you may be also. And so we anticipate the wonder of occupying our eternal abode. And it's a perfect place because the Father is there. God the Father. But according to David, communion with the divine shepherd ought to be our present reality. That ought to be something that every child of God is currently experiencing. Let's go back to Psalm 23. Let me show it to you in verse 4. Psalm 23 and verse 4. David is speaking, Yea, though I walk, and notice he's not running, He's not skipping. He's walking. Yea, though I walk through the valley. I don't intend to get stuck here. This valley is just a, a stepping stone into a higher level. I'm passing through the valley as I journey onward to an upper plane. Something that's better in store for me. You see, we don't have to get stuck in the valley. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death or deep darkness, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, which is a defensive weapon used to fight off wild beasts, and your staff, which is an instrument of direction used to guide or rescue the strange sheep, they comfort me. And why do they comfort me? Because when I see that rod hanging from your belt and that staff in your hand, they remind me that you are near. You've got my back. I, do, I need not fear. Katie Davis, the founder and director of Amazona Ministries, and I believe this is in Africa, it's a children's ministry, 
Uh, in a thank you note that she sent one of my daughters for some support that she had given, expressed the following. She wrote, when I used to have really hard days, I would remind myself, do not forget in the darkness what you have been promised in the light. Isn't that tremendous? Don't forget that. So we ask ourselves, what have we been promised? Well, the author of Hebrews reminds us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Who said that? God did. Absolutely. David asked in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Lord, where can I flee from your presence? And based on the rest of his soul, the answer, nowhere. Nowhere. Because God is omnipresent. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord ever-present. And what about the good shepherd himself, Jesus Christ? What did he say? My sheep hear my voice. Why? Because I'm within calling distance of them 24-7. And I know them, and they follow me. What do, you, what do you notice when you view a crowd of people? You're in a library or a mall or somewhere busy, and you see all these people milling about. What do you notice? Is it, is it a sea of blurry faces, all kinds of just blending in? Or do you actually see individual persons? What do you see? Point to any flock of sheep grazing on the hillside, and most folk will see just that, a flock of sheep. Nondescript, bunch of woolly whites, semi-white woolies. Uh, that's a better way to say it. But the shepherd never sees the flock that way. To him, and I quote, every lamb is different. Every face is special. Every face has a story. And every sheep has a name. We see a sea of faces. We see an all dirty flock. But the shepherd, no. To him, the gatekeeper opens, Jesus explains. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep, how? By name, and leads them out. I know my sheep, and they follow me. And then he asks, I give them what kind of life? Eternal life. And they will never perish, and no one, not even death itself, will snatch them out of my hand. Why? Because he and his omnipresent Father are one, walking among, watching over their flock. And because of this abiding presence, this divine abiding presence, David was able to say, listen, I will fear no evil because you're with me. I am not alone in this, especially when I'm passing through the dark valley, the foreboding valley. I came across this definition for valley. A ravine overhung by high precipitous cliffs filled with dense forests and well calculated to inspire dread to the timid. Think of Dorothy and the, the lion and the scarecrow and the tin man going into the woods, right? Lions and tigers and bears, oh my, what are they doing? And then as the apple trees start hucking fruit at them, if I can recall. This is the kind of forest we're talking about. And it, and it also not only does it inspire dread to the timid, what do we call the lion? The cowardly lion. It affords a covert to beasts of prey. Who wants to step into that kind of forest? Are there any fans of The Princess Bride here? You love that movie? Great. I have one. I had none in an early service. In The Princess Bride, if you're a fan, you're familiar with the fire swamp. The fire swamp. That was a menacing, menacing forest that contained R-O-U-S's, or rodents of unusual size. I kid you not, they get into this place, not only do they and the flames shooting up. It's about a fire swamp. These big guys showed up and started jumping on them. Great movie. If you haven't watched it, you need to check it out. These kinds of woods, whether you're talking about Wizard of Oz or, or The Princess Bride, 
They're expressive of something. What are they expressive of? Any great danger or cause of terror. Whatever it is that scares me, that brings terror to me, is this kind of force. And the parallel of death is perhaps foremost, isn't it? That's the last force that we all have to journey through. But, and here's the game changer, when your shepherd is near, when Jehovah Shammah, the Lord ever present, is there, I will fear no evil. Whatever form it takes, it's now nothing because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I know I'm going to get through. I'm going to be all right. I know a fellow who has a fear of crowds, writes Max Lucado. When encircled by large groups, his breath grows short, panic surfaces, and he begins to sweat like a sumo wrestler in a sauna. There's a picture for you. But then he had a golfing buddy who steps in with some sage advice. The two were at a movie theater waiting their turn to enter when fear struck again. The crowd closed in like a forest. He wanted out and out fast. His buddy told him, let's just take a few deep breaths. Then he helped manage the crisis by reminding him of the golf course. When you're hitting your ball out of the rough and you're surrounded by trees, what do you do? I look for an opening, his, his friend replied. You don't stare at the trees? Of course not. I find an opening and I, and I focus on hitting the ball through it. Well, do the same in the crowd. When you feel the panic, don't focus on the people. Focus on the opening. When it comes to navigating life's darker forest, I think the solution ultimately is a matter of vision. Vision. Will I focus on the valley or will I fix my eyes on the author and perfecter of my faith? Will we get lost in the shadows when they creep in? Or will we look to the shepherd of our souls? And you see, that's the decision we have to make. I trust after what we consider today that Jesus will occupy our vision in the week ahead. Let's, let's put him at the forefront. Let's make sure our eyes are on him no matter how dark it gets. In fact, there's no one else to really turn to because no one else has made such a grand promise as this. What did he tell his disciples before he left them? And lo, I am with you just on Sundays, always, even until the end of the what? The age. This last week, Ellen and I got to enjoy uh, celebrating her parents' 65th wedding anniversary. And they just loved it. Some of the family was able to be there. We set up outside. I, I grilled red hot dogs, so I got my red hot dog fix. It was amazing. And yes, I do make them if you're watching online and don't know what that is. And uh, we had them set up outside, and, and so we're out there. We're just having a great time. But unbeknownst to Chet and Joan, their church has planned a, a, a parade of cars to celebrate their anniversary. And so right at 1 o'clock, this string of about 15 cars come down Little Air Street in Lincoln, Maine, and like he's called, what's going on? What is this? Like, what are these people doing? And there was blue ribbon lights were flashing, horns are honking, and as they get closer, he recognizes his pastor and his sister, and people from the church are handing cards out the window and saying, happy anniversary, and they're just dumbfounded. They're just overtaken, totally surprised. It was great. We're all videotaping it and saying, thank you, thank you, you know, all that type of thing. Well, afterwards, we thought that's not good enough. Uh, one of the granddaughters had put together a collage of personal video vignettes from different grandchildren and family that could not be there. And so they had a little personal message from each of these folks that they were able to watch. And so they were just elated by all this. It was a wonderful, wonderful day. So to send a thank you note out, uh, they videotaped Chet and Joan expressing their thanks to everybody. And the thing that stood out was that Chet said, if it hadn't been for the Lord Jesus Christ, we wouldn't have made it 65 years. He gave credit to the Lord being responsible for the success and longevity of their marital relationship. 
So it was wonderful to be there and to be a part of that. Both of my parents are now occupying their eternal home. And again, it's not because they were exceptionally good. It wasn't because they did everything right in this life. But their faith was squarely centered in their faithful shepherd. And Jesus is the one that got them through the journey and now has welcomed them into their eternal bliss. And so we have a wonderful shepherd, don't we? He knows what he's doing. And at the end of it, he's going to be there to welcome us home. He's good and he's kind and he's the one we ought to keep our eyes on in the week ahead. So let's sing about him this morning as we have this final song and close the word of prayer. Jesus is strong and kind.